Hey, welcome to Apptherpology, the podcast where we chat with the people behind awesome mobile apps. So we look to understand their biggest lessons for bringing value to people, and we'll dive into interesting stories and insights about how they build and who they build for. So I'm your host, Jim Lorraine, head of growth at AMP. And I'm Paul Meinzelsen, a data scientist and co-founder of AMP. All right, today we're joined by Batiste Malagudi, the co-founder of Curry. So thank you, Batiste, for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for inviting me for the first episode. It's, it's an honor to be here. Oh, man. We're so excited. We're literally so excited. It's so cool. Um, and especially to start with your app, because honestly, it's one of the most interesting ones that I've come across yet. You have such a great angle. So would you mind first uh, telling us a little bit about Curry? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the kind words, by the way. <laughs> um, so Curry is an iOS app. Uh, it's a climate-friendly cooking app, uh, meal planning and grocery shopping as well. Um, it's available pretty much worldwide, but it's available in English, German, and French. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's for the quick introduction. I'm sure that we'll deep dive a little bit more into the, the details of the app. Yeah. So why why did you... There's a lot of other cooking apps out there, right? So what, what drove you to start Curry? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's true that... You know, when you start working on a cooking app, people are like, what are you doing? Like, there's like a thousands of other cooking apps. Like, what are mm -hmm. you even doing? Um, and I think we started it uh, for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> uh, the first one was a frustration on our parts as consumers. Frustration with the tools that we had to like figure out our next meals, organize our groceries and, and mm -hmm. be satisfied with it, not being frustrated, not looking at an empty fridge. You know, and we felt like there are tools and apps out there, but none of them felt personal enough or relevant enough to our, you know, dietary needs or preferences. Mm -hmm. uh, so I felt like there was something missing on the consumer side of things. And the second reason, to put it shortly, is that I personally believe that um, the way that we buy groceries is going to change quite a lot in the next, I don't know, five to 10 years. It mm -hmm. hasn't changed much, right? The way that we buy groceries <laughs> in the last, I don't mm -hmm. know, 30 years, right? Um, and I believe that there's a new paradigm that's coming to, you know, the way that we buy. And mm -hmm. that's what we call shoppable recipes or shoppable meal plans. So it's the ability to, you know, build a meal plan, like a combination of recipes and get all the ingredients delivered. Um, that's shoppable recipes. It's been coming since a few years, but I think COVID accelerated things quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, grocers started being more serious about their APIs. And so this use case is becoming more and more convenient and possible. But now mm -hmm. you need to have an app that actually knows what you like, knows what you want to eat. What are the habits of your household to make, you know, relevant suggestions and come up with a good meal plan for you and make it shoppable. So mm -hmm. it's the combination of our own frustration and some market dynamics, if, if you can say that, that made us think that there was an opportunity to build sort of like the next generation of, of cooking, meal planning and, and grocery shopping apps. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Um, it's, it's actually funny. I've done the research on, I was gonna say the last time grocery shopping really changed was with the Piggly Wiggly founder, Clarence Saunders, if you've heard of him. So you used to come to the grocery store and a guy stood behind the counter and kind of like gave you everything. And then he invented like the shopping cart and you could go around and pick your own things, right? So that was the first level of personalization. And now we're on to the next one. So there's something cooler about curry though. And it's what I tell everybody. It's not just the personalization and not just understanding your wants and needs. You guys have a greater mission. So do you want to let us into the greater yeah, mission? What makes it the climate friendly cooking app? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you noticed, and you noticed just now that I didn't mm -hmm. mention climate change or climate friendliness in mm -hmm. the reason why we created Curry, because originally we had no clue about, you know, the impact of our eating habits on climate change. We we're completely clueless about that. So that was absolutely mm -hmm. not part of the plan. We we're just focused on the convenience uh, and the taste part of things. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, as we started diving into recipes and cooking, we started looking into the data also of, you know, the 
carbon footprint, the land use of our eating habits. And we were quite shocked with my co-founder and chef, you know, the person who cooks the recipes for us and, and creates mm. the recipes. We were quite shocked and, and we learned so much about, you know, what we can do as individuals, first of all, but also what we haven't been told about, you know, food and its impact on climate. Um, mm. But we also realized quickly that we could build an elegant cooking app that helps you figure out what to eat next. While mm. sort of like under the hood, we're going to nudge you towards something that is better for animals, better for climate. And we do this by um, basically calculating the carbon footprint of each of our recipes for mm. each region that we have the app available. So the carbon footprint of a recipe might be different in California um, and, and in New York, the carbon footprint can be different between these two regions, depending on the seasonality. And so what's special about Curry is that we use that carbon footprint to guide our recommendations. And we also use um, local seasonality. So we show you what's in season around you for the current month. And so we can make sure that most of the recipes you're going to cook with curry are going to be seasonal. So you can go to your you know, local farmer's market if you can, if you have access to that and, and pick up what's in season and, and cook with that. I love that. I've, I've been telling people like, it's funny because organic is one level, right? So you want to have organic food. But when you talk about even the quality of food, if you have to get that item and it has to be shipped across half the world before it arrives... Like, not only is it probably worse yeah. for the environment, but it's probably not even as good as if you could just get that, you know, produced locally in season, like right where you yeah. are. Um, so I think part of the thing that yeah. we've been playing with and that you've really led the charge on is some of the, the climate friendly facts. Do you know, do you know a couple of fun facts that you could share from, from the stuff we pulled together? I won't put you on the spot. Yeah. But... <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, through my years of working on Korea, I've learned a ton mm -hmm. of, of mind blowing facts that when you read them the first time, you're like, this cannot be true. There has to be a problem with that. And mm -hmm. actually you mentioned like food miles, you know, when, when food is shipped across the world and we tend to overestimate the impact of food miles on the carbon footprint of food. Um, we think that, you know, eating local is the best thing you can do for climate while well, it's mm -hmm. very minor compared to if you focus on what you eat instead of where it comes from. Hmm. Uh, I think on average, the transport is only six or 8% of the carbon footprint of an item of food item. Um, so that's already like kind of a mind blowing fact that a lot of people, uh, don't know about. And it's, mm -hmm. it takes a while to rewire how you think about food and local food. Um, but there are some, yeah, Paul, I wanted yeah, to. See, that, that makes me happy because, um, <laughs> so I'm originally from the U.S. Um, and I, I, did, I grew up an omnivore um, and I became a vegetarian uh, something like 15 years ago uh, when I was, when I was living and doing some research in Turkey. And um but then I subsequently I've spent about the last 10 years in Singapore and India. And I've, for me now, vegetarian fare, and I was going to ask you about this in the Curry app, vegetarian fare is as much as I remember it from my youth was, was like veggies on the side of a meat dish, right? So like a side of broccoli and a side of green peas or something. Mm. Um, and, and that's why I would always get the question when I would go home. It's like, well, what do you eat? You just eat beans <laughs> and broccoli. <laughs> um, and that would, that, that, that awareness, but when you're in Southeast Asia, when you're in Thailand or Malaysia or in India, <clears throat> there's so much diversity and variety in vegetarian fare. Um, and a lot of it has to do with spices that we didn't have available cumin and coriander, yeah. all these things that <clears throat> just aren't really indigenous or, or local in the U S and I, I often thought if I, if I move back, if I'm back in the U S I would be very sad if I had to eat entirely local and I didn't, I couldn't get that, the kind yeah. of spices that aren't necessarily from there. Um, and so to hear that transport costs are really only <laughs> six to 8%, uh, and hopefully spices are anyway, the least heavy and, and least Probably. perishable. Um, but I will note that in the curry app, you don't seem to have a spices section, uh, on the home screen, it pops up and it's like herbs, 
it's a very French, yeah. actually, I think, approach. Um, so anyway, yeah. I'll end with that, but I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> it's a mind blowing, but also a happy fact for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing every day in conversations I have with you know, people around me that we've been we've been taught the wrong thing about, you know, climate change, our individual responsibility. We've been told to focus on, you know, taking shorter showers like mm -hmm. this is garbage advice <laughs> in, in the grand scheme of things um, in relation to yeah the impact of our food, the impact of. I don't know, flying for your individual um, footprint. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, there's been a lot of learnings and definitely a complete shift in my perception. I started curry an omnivore, completely clueless, and I'm now on a vegan diet. So yeah, a lot of changes. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, it's not why we created curry. It's just something that I'm really proud that we can bring um, to our users, just like Paul said, our conception of vegetarian food is the size that we used to have next to our meat. So mm -hmm. let's bring some diversity. Let's bring some novelty and delicious new tasty dishes to, to your week. I love it. So how many showers could you take per airplane flight? No, I'm just kidding. We won't get into that. <laughs> um, no, one thing that I really like is just the overall concept of creativity is bred from constraint. So like if there's a constraint, it forces us to be creative, right? We always kind of, um, we have that angle. So the thing I like about you, about Curry, to your point, you didn't do it necessarily. It wasn't created for the purpose of low carbon, carbon impact, understanding climate impacts on climate at first. But what it's done is a couple things. One is it's carved out like a really nice niche for you. But secondly, you're much more creative in the foods and the recipes that you offer because it's not like cheeseburger soup five days a week. You know, <laughs> like it's you're, it, it, by adding that constraint of trying to find local, by adding the constraint of trying to do, you know, low carbon and things like that, you've um, it, it kind of opens up this whole world of other dishes that probably a lot of other people haven't experienced before. I um, mean, it's so cool. So yeah, absolutely. From the app perspective, uh, you've been featured by the App Store. Is it once or twice so far? Oof, more than that. So really, in yeah, yeah. So we launched in May 2020. Um, okay. We got picked up by the French App Store. So you have editors in each market that like spot your app and they might want to feature it if they find it cool. So we got mm -hmm. featured in July 2020. Mm -hmm. um, in the French app store. And then I think we've been featured probably 20 times on the French app store, but up until wow. last summer, the summer of 2022, we had not been featured in the U S yet, but mm -hmm. that changed in, in July, 2022. So you received that email or this notification saying your app has been picked up by the U S app store. Oh man. It's like party, you know, yeah. you're just so happy and you celebrate. Uh, and actually, I, I got this email again this morning. So we're again featured on the US App Store. It's ah, been so very, cool. it's like very recurring. Once they know you, once they like what you do, and you push yeah. updates regularly, they they really um, they really feature you a lot, and that's that's great because it really starts this organic flywheel of growth where mm -hmm. you know, people discover you, they rate the app. It's really important to make sure that people are going to rate the app at the right time. <clears throat> mm -hmm. you, you said when they, when you push updates regularly, is that, is that just like a, you, you imagine they have just, you know, some automatic algorithmic it, your rate of, of update pushing or, or do you mean that it needs to be that you're releasing new features or substantively creatively adding to the app? Uh, yeah. Just would love to hear a little yep. bit more about what you mean by pushing updates. So app store experts probably are going to curse me and send me DMs because I don't have any insider information about how that goes, how that works. I believe that it's, it might, there might be some algorithmic. I've heard that it's more, even more so uh, on the Android store mm. uh, than on the app store where it's more editorial. So you might be discovered by you know, an editor, they might hear about you. They might, you know, in the U S it all started because we got featured in TechCrunch. 
So someone at Apple saw that article and read about the app and featured it. So it was not about the, the amount of updates, but it does help if you're playing, if you're playing the game of like, you know, updating, fixing bugs, answering reviews. It's all, of course, going to be seen and perceived as something that you're doing well. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's purchase, I think. So was there a process in getting the initial feature or getting in TechCrunch or all that, or has it all been organic? No pun intended. So the... <laughs> Sorry. The, the... <laughs> no, that was a good one. The, <laughs> the first feature was uh, completely organic, I think. Um, you know, it was a new app. And I guess that somehow it gets on their radar as well when there's a new app that gets really high ratings from the beginning. There might be something algorithmic about that. Um, and regarding the TechCrunch article, it's a journalist that I've been following for a while. He's also on a vegan diet. I like his article. So I thought, let's shoot him a DM. We had a common interest in um, Mid Journey. I don't know if you know Mid Journey. It's this mm -hmm. AI images creating, you know, you can create an image based on the prompt. Um, yep. And yeah, we just started talking about a couple of things and um, told him about Curry and he was um, interested enough to write a story and it was fantastic. I, I didn't expect that, but yeah. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like you found the right person. So you guys hit it off right away. Yeah, absolutely. So while we're on this topic, I have, I have one observation uh, question. Um, there's been a lot of, I've seen a lot of activity and discussion around just a, several articles recently about the, the growing importance of Reddit in search and this sensationalized to the point of like, is Reddit replacing Google search, right? Um, Reddit. So I was TikTok? interested to, I was, I was just say, kind of Googling around one. about Curry just to see what else is on there. And I came across a post from you on Reddit two years ago, right? So right when you were yep. getting started that I made this app on, on, um, you know, I made this I iOS app and, and it's about this. It was just like a very brief post. Yep. And then just, there was just a lot of comments, a lot of conversation. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. Just the quality of the feedback you were getting and the response that early. And it was just, it felt very sincere. I think the yeah. words like um, yeah, delightful and, um, and 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 kind and just you know a lot of sincerity there. So I'm interested. Like, right? It's amazing the, the App Store mm -hmm. and and TechCrunch, but this was very early in your journey. Um, what was that like? Getting you know was Reddit? Did you remember that post? Do you remember that conversation yeah. or? Um, it's just, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. tell us more. I haven't thought about that since a while, actually, because I used to mention Reddit as one of the first, uh, channels where we got our initial users. And it's true that it works really well because first of all, the Reddit community is very wholesome and very progressive as well. Uh, in my opinion, there are a lot of really exciting communities, whether it's for recipes or, uh, I don't know, something called volume eating. I don't even know what that is, but there's like a volume eating subreddit and you get, yeah, you get good engagement when you post something that is sincere, you know, you're not trying to link to your YouTube channel for the recipe. You're just sharing the recipe with a photo that you took. They don't like professional photos on Reddit. You just take a photo mm -hmm. of, the cook, of the meal that you cooked at home. That's how they want to see it because they want to see it as authentic. Um, and yeah, the response was very, very sincere and very encouraging for us. Um, so that was a great channel for us to post recipes from time to time. Some of these posts have done wonders in terms of user acquisition. So I would definitely recommend it. It's, it's a sort of like, you know, manual low cost, uh, mm -hmm. acquisition channel. It requires a lot of time still, you know, I don't want to do like a quick post that's not meaningful. That's, you know, that I'm going to copy paste on several subreddits. That's not how I do it. You have to do it very authentically. Um, and this is how you get the most interesting conversations. I have a follow up to that. So how, how much had you like established yourself or set up a baseline on Reddit before you did that? Or was it 
like this was one of the first posts that you had made or how you know how much how much yeah. pre-work because usually a lot of times when you talk about bigger platforms and things you kind of want to create your own you know taking time investing and interacting and stuff and then you assert what you wanted to say was yours more like hey like more like an introduction post or was it something that you've already kind of laid the framework and then yeah. made your post so um a little bit of both I had thought about this ahead of time and I knew that I shouldn't come up as a completely new account posting <laughs> my app, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. not going to yield necessarily good reactions. Like people are going to see it as a, you know, as, um, you're just trying to shoot your shot and that's not necessarily cool. Uh, mm -hmm. so I did spend time on Reddit, but really just reading about interesting stuff and seeing interesting recipes. Not mm -hmm. posting so much, I think. I've, I haven't done that many posts. But when I started posting, yeah, they could see that I was not, you know, this newly created account mm -hmm. that was created specifically for posting about the app. Um, I think the fact that you write as an individual as well, you know, like I created this app, I learned to code to build curry. And that was also a story that uh, feels more personal than, oh, yeah, we're this startup, uh, you know, it, it would feel less personal. Mm -hmm. No, it's all really good advice. I'm trying to save Reddit from a bunch of people who are going to hear this and then all of a sudden start to post. I made an app too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, no, that's really, really good insight. Fair so enough. on the app, what are your key user behavior metrics and how did you choose them? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that there are two categories of user behavior metrics that matter to us. Mm -hmm. The first one is usage, you know, like number of cook recipes, how many recipes people cook per month, how many times they interacted and use the shopping list, because then we mm -hmm. know that, you know, they use it to organize their week, their groceries. And that's important to us because we want to be as useful as possible. Mm -hmm. Then we have the number of sessions as well, which I think is fascinating when I see uh, a user with more than thousand sessions. 1,200 sessions I saw earlier. Wow. insane to me. And we have... 1,200 sessions in what kind of a time period? So the last date that I have for this user is May 2022. And I'm not sure if that's even possible or if you know, we've been switching from analytics from time to time. So maybe we don't have the full history or... But yeah, it's it's a lot... It's a lot of sessions Back in for to add an you know, item. six months. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So the first one was, yeah. first one was um, general usage and sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Was there... And then the second one, which is, um, not, it's not more important for the business, of course, but it's more important to me, um, mm -hmm. is like the metrics around sustainability. So <clears throat> when we, like the app basically detects when you cook a recipe based on, you know, if you read all the steps, how much time you spent on it, that kind of very simple um, indications. And we assume that you cooked a recipe. And when okay, we do let's, that, let's we track, clarify that for yeah. a minute, because that's a, that's a really key point there. So you're not simply relying on the user to say, I cooked this recipe to like toggle something, click something at the end. You've basically yeah. set up some basic equation and algorithm that says, all right, when a user has done this, we're going to auto define that as cooked the recipe. Is yeah, that, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And then they get, they get a push notification that's just scheduled locally in the app that asks them, Hey, how was your food? And they can rate the dish. Um, and this is also when they rate the app because usually the experience is good. And we'll talk about that. You know, the quality of content is important to us. Um, so it leads to a good rating and from someone who just cooked a meal. Um, and yeah, so there's this algorithmic determination of when someone cooks a recipe. And when we send that event to our analytics, we also send whether the meal was in season in the user's region, whether um, it had meat or not, and the user diet as well. So if we have an omnivore user that cooked a meatless recipe, that's a win in our book, right? <laughs> um, and we also send the carbon footprint of that recipe. And the carbon footprint is also localized, meaning that it's per month. 
per region, so California in October, it's going to have a certain carbon footprint. And that allows us then to analyze, you know, the sustainability of what people cooked with curry. And it's interesting to see that, you know, we have a majority of omnivore users, despite, mm -hmm. you know, one may think that we have mostly vegetarian users. It's not the case at all. Uh, most of them are omnivore or pescatarian. And yet 80% of the recipes that they cook are meatless recipes because, you know, we nudge them towards, towards that. And mm -hmm. we show them beautiful photos of beautiful dishes that really don't need meat. Mm -hmm. um, and the carbon footprint of these recipes is also on average 60% smaller than the U.S. average. And more than 90% of these recipes are cooked in season, respective to the user's Wow. region and what's in season around them. So that's metrics that matter to me. It doesn't matter at all to, I don't know, investors or, mm. or a lot of people, but to, to me, it matters a lot. And I think it shows that, you know, we've heard times and times again, oh yeah, but you know, eating habits, you cannot change that better build like carbon capture devices, uh, because we're never going to be able to change the way people eat that. I, I just think that's not necessarily true. And this is why our ambition is not just to build this cute cooking app, right? It's just to mm -hmm. um, be at the center of the eating decisions and grocery shopping decisions of, of dozens of millions of people. And we will nudge them towards less meat. We'll nudge them towards climate-friendly dishes, and they will feel enriched by that experience, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I've seen the pictures on the app too, and they are absolutely gorgeous. So the... The user itself, do they get like a scorecard of showing their carbon footprint and things like that? So they don't see their own carbon footprint. Like we, we don't like track what's the average carbon footprint of the recipes that you've cooked. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't show that in the app. We don't compute it on, on, on the back end either. Um, for several reasons. First of all, we noticed that people don't interact so much with the carbon footprint card that you can see on recipes. They don't tap mm -hmm. on it so much as much as you might think. So the data is not so important. What's important is that we get the result that I told you, you know, that they cook way less meat than they would normally do. So we don't do this because I'm not sure it's the most, the top priority for us. Um, but that could be interesting. But, you know, like we don't capture all the meals that people cook. So it wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. always be uh, relevant or calculate their entire carbon footprint. I, no, I think that's brilliant, though, because it's kind of like the diet plan. When you go on a diet, you think I am on a diet. And every time you see food, you think I am on a diet and it makes you want to eat more because you just think I am on a diet. And everything you do is focused on. I am on a diet right now. I can't eat it. I'm on a diet. Like it affects your mood. It affects everything, right? Which is why diets don't work because they're built on, you know, telling somebody about what they can't do yeah. and putting restrictions on them. You know, we said, we said that constraint breeds creativity, but this is like the wrong, this is the wrong kind. Then you creatively figure out how to eat different food um, that breaks your diet. Um, so this I think is cool though, because you're not doing it by, I think of the, um, like the fuel efficiency gauge on your car. That, that makes a positive impact, I think, because people look at it and nobody's like, let me drive that thing down to zero, you know? Um, but the way that you're doing it is you're, like you said, you're encouraging people, you're getting majority omnivore people to come on the app and to cook recipes that are climate friendly without explicitly saying, hey, this is, you know, do it for the environment. You're not yeah. saying do it for the environment. You're kind of saying do it for you. Look how delicious this food is, right? And people are without that focus being on environmental sustainability that they're just making really, really good food, but it is helping, you know, it's helping the entire planet. So to that extent, what kind of, what kind of content do you provide your users and what thought behind goes behind the different content that you send beyond just the, the pictures, which I'm like drooling because yeah. they're amazing. But <laughs> yeah. So it's a good question. Um, and we're still early in our journey. So most of the content that we create is recipes and the quality behind it. I I've seen it 
in the past and my past experiences that the quality of the food, the quality of the food photography is really important. The user experience, the mm -hmm. interface is really important. Um, so that's been most of our efforts to date. But there is an interest, maybe there's more niche around like tips for sustainability. Like how do you keep cilantro more than three days without it going bad, right? Like that kind of small tips or yeah. how do you um, prevent food waste? There, There is interest for this type of content. And so mm -hmm. we will get to that point, right? Um, but right now we're really focused on, on the quality of, of the recipe simply because it's so important that the first time that someone cooks with curry, it's going to be a banger. It's going to be something that they love. Like mm -hmm. if it's not, they're not coming back. Right. So it's, yep. it's, it's, it costs five times less to retain a user than to acquire a new one. So we're putting a lot of efforts in the quality of, of, of the recipes. And now, yeah, but as can you, you know, tell us a little yeah. more, how do you define quality of recipe? How, well, what does that process look yep. like? Yeah. That, well, that's a very, very vast question, but first of all, I trust, uh, with, you know, my entire heart, uh, the chef Philippe that I work with, uh, he used to be, you know, a carnivore, like a big meat eater who used to say that vegans were extremists and things like that. Right. That was like, I don't know, 10 years ago when we had these conversations and we were both clueless about the topic, but he radically changed his position and he barely eats any meat anymore. And he has a sense of what is good, first of all, because he's a good, like, home cook. And he really has a feel of what is accessible for people and what is not accessible. He's not the kind of chef that will work in a three star Michelin kitchen and make things that are just completely out of reach of the normal household. Um, so he, he has a good feel for that. And it's kind of undescribable, first of all. Um, and then it's, you know, the amount of ingredients, how sophisticated, how difficult they are to find. We need everything in curry because it's personalized. So it's going to sort of like guide you towards something that is suited for you. But yeah, we don't go for any more for recipes, but like 28 ingredients with like 16 different spices and things like that. This is not accessible. This is not something that a family is going to be able to do during the week. So it's a subtle balance. We need a little bit of everything, but we need to label everything really well so that our algorithm is going to be able to show the right recipe to the right person. And, you know, this topic is becoming similar with the content that we want to post, the messages that we want to send. And, I, I'm lucky to be working with a really cool, cool company right now uh, mm -hmm. that sends like personalized push notifications. <laughs> um, and it, it is really important for us, just like we put a lot of effort in the quality of, of the recipes to put a lot of effort into the quality of the messages, like quality over quantity for sure. Um, and it's just a miracle that you guys are building that kind of tool for us, at least for the way that we think about push notifications and messages. Appreciate that. Um, okay. So tell us more though about, cause it's, it's just really interesting to hear your thought process. It, what I hear is just this deep simplicity in what you're focused on. I, I think I, I've lost track in this conversation, short conversation so far of how many times you're like, we're not looking at that yet. We're not looking at that yet. I think that's so key. I mean, as a startup, but, but, uh, but also as a mobile app developer uh, to create that mo that experience. Um, and your folk. So, so we hear you loud and clear on the quality of the recipe and just that. Um, tell me if you don't want to talk about this yet, but I think eventually you're going to offer a sort of subscription. Uh, and you know, that's a key part of, of Curry as a business. Yeah. Um, whether in line with that or just separately, maybe if you play it out a little bit further, what is, what are some of the other core value propositions that Curry might enable 
right? And, and where we start to see the behavior change elements of this, because you've also sort of said, I thought, I think it was really interesting when you said earlier on, the way we buy groceries will change. That the way we cook change. And, and when I think about cooking, so much of it feels to me like a motivation problem, like a trade-off problem, like a, a assignment of attention and effort in a crowded world full of lots of things going on. To have the intentionality and purpose of saying, I'm going to cook something rather than do all of the easy things um, that are alternatives to cooking things. Um, does curry have a role in in, in, in you, you said that it's possible to change the world by changing behavior, and you've mentioned doing that through nudges. Is is changing intentionality part of this, or you know, and how does that manifest in terms of a feature? Now, now I made it yeah. really abstract and complicated, but now reduce it back to like a feature and add your dash of elegant simplicity. Yeah. What's the features or the feature that you want to see there? that you think is going to be so simple, but so elegantly serving the purpose mm -hmm. of the, of the user. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. It's a very complicated topic. You know, like how do you get someone who never cooks to cook for the first time and, and get it started? Right. And then they like, Oh my God, that was so easy. That was so good. I listened to a good podcast while I was cooking. I had a blast. My mm -hmm. partner is amazed by the food. I'm such a hero. I'm going to do it again. So mm -hmm. that's the experience, the, the magic moment, right? Um, so first of all, and that's kind of a disappointing answer, but <laughs> most people who are going to download the app already have an interest in cooking. First of all, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to convince someone who never cooks, never buys groceries to cook, right? But still, let's say it's someone who downloaded the app, who has an interest in cooking, but still hasn't cooked uh, with curry, right? Our goal is going to be, you know, maybe look into our analytics and look at the most or like the first cooked recipes of our users who are the least experienced. We can filter that in our analytics and see, okay, this is the recipe that they start cooking with and then they cook even more. So this might be the best recipe to promote first. This might be the winner. This might be the one that converts you and creates this magic moment. That's something that we will explore. We have a treasure trove of data uh, that we can use to create that magic moment. Um, and you were right about, you know, talking about the subscription. The subscription that we're going to bring um, introduces a few key features that really sort of like make Curry transition from a cooking app that you use for inspiration and maybe building your grocery list, which is something that people do a lot with the app to an app that you can really use on a weekly basis to manage all your meals, all your groceries and, and, and shopping needs. Um, and these features are, for instance, meal planning, uh, family mode, where everything is synchronized across your household, shopping oh. lists, preferences of, I don't know, your kids, things like that. Um, so that it becomes some sort of operating system for your household when it comes to like eating decisions. So we're moving towards cooking app that is a little bit maybe more advanced or more sophisticated than so, some others or not uh, to something that is more uh, convenience based and, and really like a tool that you use as a tool to manage your, your, your uh, weekly life. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, that's the orientation that we're taking. We still see that, you know, the majority of people who actually start cooking with curry are people who are interested in cooking. It's much harder to, you know, convince people who don't. So of course we have to focus on the ones who do, right. Mm -hmm. Um, but later in the later stage, we will also have a lot of growth potential trying to convince these people who don't cook to try for the first time. Yeah. I, th I think there's a, there's a big trend happening. People used to make with their hands. People used to build things that was, you know, are you a blacksmith or a cobbler or things like that? And today, you know, in the world of social media, right? If you don't, if you don't post, if you don't create something, 
someone, you know, somebody else will fill that void. So I think there's a missing piece that a lot of people have where we used to create and now we don't create. So, and, and when you create to your point, that wow moment, you have that sense of accomplishment. You have, you know, you, you did something, you did this, something you can hold in your hands, something you can serve to others and show people. And there's this whole feeling that I think a lot of people are missing out on now because, you know, just in the culture, we don't create. We don't physically create. We don't, you know, you get your meals delivered and things like that. Everything just kind of happens and you just kind of exist through it. So I think what you're doing has so much more purpose than even what it shows on the surface, which is really cool. So I did have one note too that I really, really liked. And it was something that you told us separately, not on this, not on this call. Um, But it was everything that you say, you mentioned that you have a deep respect for your users and you've said it a few times here and like, you know, I don't want to give ingredients that have, uh, you know, uh, recipes that have a thousand ingredients. I don't want to create things that are inaccessible that look pretty in a picture, but you can't cook at home. Um, you mentioned it with notifications. You said, I didn't want to send people notifications because I've received them all and they're really annoying when I get them most of the time. Um, so I want to make sure that what I send adds value to everybody's life. So I guess it isn't so much a question as a compliment, but throughout the entire process, the the one strand that I see that's been really consistent is not just food, not just, you know, being, being low carbon footprint, um, is that it's clear that you have a deep care and compassion for your user base. You mentioned the retention statistic, which is funny because most people say it, oh yeah, it takes, costs five times less to keep somebody. You know, a lot of people have heard it. A lot of people know, a lot of people say it. Very few actually live it out. Um, and I think that, I think that you do, and you can see it kind of in everything from the simplicity of your app to the features you offer to, like I said, your standpoint of, I I don't want to add a feature if it's going to bother people or if it's going to annoy them or if it's going to drive them away. Um, Because, and I think people can sense it down from the first Reddit app, you know, from your first Reddit post that you mentioned to the reason why you continue to get featured in the app store um, is because of that level of, of care that you have. And, and it's balanced out even in the content that you were talking about offering. Um, it's just, it's cool to see because you can actually see it. You know, you guys are living it out and it's so cool. Um, you're not just load the top of the funnel and we'll get whatever trickles out. You're like, we're trying to build something bigger here. I mean, I think people can sense that. And that's probably why, probably why your attention is really good. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of compliments. Uh, I must say though, that, you know, regarding the push notifications, I think the main reason, but maybe it's, a little bit of both, but the main reason we hardly push any notification until we discovered you guys uh, was the fear of not being relevant. And of course, to bother people, but like it, it, it still is an obsession to be relevant for us, to be relevant in the suggestions that we make and things like that. And we cannot be perfect, but we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, and with the messages, it was even more true, like what message should I bother people with? It has to be interesting. And I think my thought process on this has also drastically matured with conversations with you guys. Uh, and you said something interesting, James, that was, um, you know, most of the time when you receive a notification that is, I don't know if it's from Uber Eats or whatnot, it's going to be like, order now, order now. You're probably hungry, order some food now and you're going to get a discount. And most of the time, it's not the right timing. It's not the right moment. So you're not going to actually take action. And your emotional response to this is that you're going to sort of like, in your mind, lower the score of Uber in your mind, right? Um, But it still remains like top of mind. So they're still doing something good, I guess, for for their business. Um, And you said something that, you know, you're rarely going to be perfect on timing when you suggest the recipe to cook via push notification, but you can at least send a message that's going to reinforce the love that people have for your app, for your brand, reinforce the reason why they downloaded your app. Um, And I think it, yeah, inspired me a lot and inspired us in the messages that we created about, yeah, reinforcing, like celebrating the fact that these people took time to download this app that they have the intention to cook more seasonally, to cook 
healthier recipes. So let's celebrate that and not bother them with like, you have to cook this now, but bring them something interesting that is aligned with the brand, with our values. And I think that mm-hmm. this is something that really took shape um, with the conversations that we had. So thank That's you for awesome. that. Yeah, I'd love to take credit. It's totally Thank Paul. You. That was all Paul. <laughs> no, but it's it's it's. I think we get in the trap of thinking that's what they have to be because those are the push notifications we get. So we think that's what they have to be. They have to be high pressure, high pressure, high pressure. And one thing we talked about that's unique to you guys is, you know, if you're recommending healthy food, but I'm having a rough day, so I just am going to throw a pizza in the oven and just call today a failure and tomorrow will be a new day. If I get all these notifications that are like, cook healthy now, cook healthy now, it might actually, it might make me feel bad, like not just annoy me, but make me feel bad because what am I poisoning my kids by just throwing this pizza in the oven? You know, whereas I should be making like this amazing linguine or something. Um, so, so, so yeah, I like, you know, the thought process came from Paul too, that there's a greater mission. It's so helpful when your app has a great mission and yours has a great mission. It has these undertones that you, someone can be proud for having your app on their phone, even if they're not cooking that night. Because, yeah. you know, it's like, congrats, because you know what? You've made three of these, you know, like you're in the top 1% or whatever, you know, as an example. But it's, yeah. it's just making you feel accomplished. The second thing it does is it helps your word of mouth. So I think about what is a notification you would get from a company that you would slide your phone across the table to somebody else and go check that out. And I think some of yours, like the tomato fact is one that just stuck with me, that if uh, that, like a natural organically grown tomato makes seven times less, I believe, greenhouse gases than one that's made in a actual greenhouse. Um, like that's one that it's so interesting. I would stop and I would tell somebody, like I told my wife, like, check this out. Like, did you know this? This is so cool. And I like read her the list because I can cheat and see all the push notifications at the same time. I like <laughs> read through all the facts to her. And I'm like, this is so awesome. Um, but how many push notifications do you get? I just got another Starbucks one that's like, today's double star day. Who am I going to be like, hey, it's double star day, you know, just like yesterday was and the day before that. Um, so that's where I think you're, I think you're on the right path. And I love, I love just, you've been so proactive in like building these lists and creating, you know, new and interesting facts and fun things that, uh, it's, it's been really, really fun to watch and kind of learn with you. And it makes me excited for the people who are, who are going to get them as well. Cause I know they'll have the same reaction. So really broad question to end it. Um, but one of my, mm-hmm. one of my favorite ones along those same lines. So throughout this entire process, what is the like most fun or interesting thing you've learned and it can be you know about building the app being featured in the app store it can be about the product itself or about the customers who use it but like what's been one of your most interesting things that you've come across in this whole process of creating journey, you know something yeah. related to the organization yeah yeah totally doesn't yeah. Even have to be yeah so you know we talked about some small facts that are like mind-blowing and and they're fun to mm-hmm. to to talk about um but I think, you know, when I look at who I was before I started this uh, and what I believed in or what I thought, what I knew and where I am today and the opinions that I was sort of like loosely holding back then uh, about, I don't know, food, agriculture, veganism, whatever, like it just made me realize that I know nothing. And I'm trying to have less opinions now because I'm probably going to be wrong on something that I haven't really thoroughly studied. And, you know, we hear all the time opinions and opinions on stuff, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn. And most of the time now I look at the subject and I'm like, well, I'm going to take this with a pinch of salt because I know nothing and I'm sure that it's probably wrong. Or So I think it all taught me to be a little bit more humble about, you know, people's choices and decisions and understanding that I don't have the full picture and I'll probably want to have. So yeah, be a little bit less judgmental of things I don't know and try to have less opinions. I think is the biggest lesson. That's cool. That's a lot more than that's, that's deep. That's good. That's one of those things where you're like, I, when you start to create an app, are you like, I'm going to do this so that when I'm done, I'm going to be so much more of a better person at the end and less judgmental and whatever. No, that's good. I love this though. You have a good purpose for like the whole, 
the whole process is based on a solid person. So, Paul, anything else from your side? No, I think let's let's. This has been really fun. Absolutely, thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us, Batista. Thank you, guys. And thank you so much for episode one. This is going to be really hard to follow. So, <laughs> so what the heck? <laughs> anyway, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Batista. Um, Again, this will be the Anthropology Podcast. This will be episode number one, and will be available hopefully everywhere that that you listen to apps and enjoy listening to apps. So, uh, thank you again for joining us, and we'll sign off.